It's the Jack Tomzak Show. Joining us now to talk about his civics education endeavor is U.S. District Court Judge John Thunheim. Hi, Judge. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon. How are you? It's, it's, uh, it's a podcast, so it could be a good, good middle of the night. Um, Time of the day. Okay. What do I call a judge outside of a courtroom? You can just call me judge. That's fine. It's okay. no problem. <laughs> I will just call you judge. All right. The We're talking to you because the uh, MinPost has an article that uh, says you are launching a civics education project. And I think this is a fantastic idea. And can you tell me what got you to this point? Well, there have been a number of courts in our country that have set up uh, education centers. I was particularly inspired by one set up in uh, by the Second Circuit in uh, the Southern District of New York. Uh, and it's, it's very well done. I had a chance to tour uh, that. Uh, and then the Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, uh, several years ago in his year end message said, you know, we're, we're kind of dropping our understanding of democracy in this country. And we have an obligation to our young people to teach them about democracy and, and uh, about the three branches of government, about uh, the Constitution. And we're not doing that. And he really called on judges to play a role in this. And I'm taking him up on that. And we're creating judicial uh, education centers. We're calling them justice and democracy centers uh, in both of our St. Paul and Minneapolis courthouses so that we can welcome primarily school kids, but anyone really who wants to come and, and see the centers. Thomas Jefferson said, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, learn civics, people. No, he said, an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. Uh, if, if the people doing the voting don't either know what they're voting, what the issues are that they're, they're, they're voting about, and don't understand how the system works. Uh, they're easily manipulated, I think, and, and may, maybe not making bad choices, but making uninformed choices. And with how politics is nowadays, and maybe it's always been this way, people have no idea what's true, what's real, and politicians will, will say whatever they have to say to get elected. And I think the more people know about how the system is set up, the better off we're going to be in the long run. So I think this is this is fantastic. I, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, people need to have that foundation of understanding of what our Constitution provides uh, by way of protections and rights. They really need to know uh, the value of a democracy and why democracy has served us well uh, over a long period of time. And, uh, and he here's an interesting statistic that I read, and that is that over the past 50 years, it is estimated that we have spent as a country a thousand times more money on science and technology and math education than we have on history and civics education. And I think it's starting to show. I mean, uh, you know, people who uh, don't have any real trust in the Congress, for example, um, you know, I think that's a shame because they don't really understand the role of the Congress. Uh, and, and Congress is probably partially to blame there for maybe reach compromises. But at the same time, um, you know, that's the way democracy can be messy and people have to have trust that ultimately the right decisions are going to be made. And I do think that social media has made a difference here, too, because everyone has a platform to say whatever they want. It doesn't have to be true. And uh, people tend to believe what they want to believe. So, you know, I, this is a small way to try to provide civics education in a way that uh, can inspire young people to really understand our democracy better. Now, I agree with uh, a lot of what you just said. I would I would put a lot of blame on Congress for how people view Congress. Um, but regardless, I don't think people understand um, 
much when they look at what Congress does. I remember the first time I, I was out in, in, in D.C. and saw the House of Representatives and there was one person talking. And I was like, well, where's everybody else? <laughs> and and uh, I, said, well, I, I was told, well, this isn't Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Uh, this isn't how they do it anymore. It's just there's one person talking for the record. Um, this is a monumental undertaking because I think that, uh, and you brought up how people, we spent so much time, effort, energy, and money on, on STEM education and less on history and civics and, and uh there's just so much that people don't know. Heck, I was a history major at the University of Minnesota, and there's there's so much stuff that I don't know. Um, so to make up that, uh, that's going to take a lot of work. So good for you, Judge. This is uh, a Herculean effort. I, I think it's important. And we're working you know, with social studies teachers who are very excited about this. I mean, hoping, hoping to bring back the kinds of field trips that are, are wonderful for kids. You know, I mean, I, I was inspired when I was a ninth grader by a civics education teacher who just said, OK, we're going to debate public issues and we're going to use the format of a trial. And I had so much fun with that that um, I had no idea that I wanted to be a lawyer before we did that. After that, I had, I had no, nothing else that I wanted to do. Hmm. Uh, I'm hoping that we can inspire kids, not necessarily just to be lawyers, although that's part of it or be a judge someday, but really to be a good citizen and to find the kind of career that enables them to be good citizens in our democracy. If you look back, uh, if you read back on the uh, political speeches and debates from 150 years ago, uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates, like people would go to these debates, these very long events, they would go to these on purpose and pay attention and know what the politicians were talking about. And they were uh, in-depth debates and conversations. And right now it's, uh, it's insults and sound bites when politicians debate. And I don't think the, if it were serious conversations about serious topics, I don't know if people would tune in to debates to watch. And that's not that's not a good thing for the the health and and future of our country. I think. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, I think the value of public debate on uh, serious issues, and we all know that nearly every public issue there is disagreement to a certain extent, yep. and a debate about it is good. And people should uh, learn from for themselves you know, what the what they think the right answer should be instead of getting it from their favorite social media site, their favorite news site or, or whatever else, because there are two sides to every issue. At least is that there's many, many sides to uh, and people need to be part of that. And I just when you have surveys that show that a quarter of Americans can't even name the three branches of government, I mean, I think that is an issue. And of those 25 percent at least a third can't even name one branch of government for goodness sakes well it's the house senate and the white house piece of cake i'm kidding right. your honor i am kidding <laughs> but that's true and and there's so much i don't know it, it's just the very basics of how Everything works, how government functions, the the separation of powers, the different the different levels of government. And and we spend like people get taxed to pay for the operation of government and have no no idea really what it what it is and what it does and how it's supposed to function, how it how it is functioning. And and that's that that's not good. It, it really isn't. Uh, and you talk about I mean, everyone knows that there's something called the First Amendment. But I read a Freedom Forum survey that uh, demonstrated that up to one third of Americans can't even name one of the five rights that are protected in the First Amendment. You know, you'd think that most people would know that the First Amendment protects freedom of speech because that's a very cherished right in our country. But when surveyed, one third of Americans couldn't name any of the five freedoms that are protected in the First Amendment. So I think we have a lot of work to do. 
Uh, I think uh, I hope that we inspire other uh, districts across the country, other state Supreme Courts to establish uh, centers like this. I hope we can work together with our own state Supreme Court uh, to expand the reach. And part of what we're going to do, and I think this is important, is that we're going to have an online presence to continue the learning experience for kids. You know, they, I have a granddaughter. I know how much time she spends on uh, an iPad or on a, a, an electronic device at, at her young age. Um, that's where kids are learning these days. So we need to be there as well to expand the learning opportunity beyond just the visit to what we hope will be museum quality exhibits. All right, hang tight, Judge Thunheim. Uh, we're going to take a very quick break, pay some bills. I'm talking with U.S. District Court Judge John Thunheim. You're listening to The Jack Tom Tech Show on AM 1280, The Patriot. Hey, stop being a freeloader and get over to jacktomzack.com and join the Patreon movement. Welcome back to the Jack Tomzak Show. I'm Jack Tomzak. I'm talking with U.S. District Court Judge John Thunheim, who is creating a civics education center. Is that an accurate way of putting it, Judge? It is. It is. We're calling it a justice and democracy center because those are the two issues that we likely will focus on the most. And we're going to focus not on just uh, telling a story of the Constitution, but also telling the story of important cases throughout our nation's history, cases that students can understand are relevant today in establishing uh, the rights that they have, and including cases that were uh, viewed in hindsight as massive mistakes. So we're not going to shy away from those issues as well, because I think that's an important part of the learning experience for students. Uh, Minnesota's own Dred Scott decision would be on that list. Am I right? Absolutely. It, it, may, it, it likely was the, probably the worst, along with the Japanese internment decision during World War II, two of the worst decisions that were ever reached by a court in our country. And I think everyone recognizes that now, but we need to demonstrate that sometimes mistakes are made by courts too. Now, I think everyone does recognize that, but you are going to find in, in teaching history, civics, uh, just the Constitution itself, that there are, there's lots of things that not everybody agrees on. And it, it, volunteering to become the authority on justice and democracy in the Constitution, whose perspective do you take? Well, is it up to you? We're going to encourage debate. I mean, we don't have we don't have all the right answers. I mean, we want students to debate what justice means to them. And justice means something different to different people, I think. I mean, our obligation as a court is to provide equal justice under law. What does that mean? People can debate what that means in and of itself. I mean, it certainly means procedural justice, which we're obligated to do. But ideas of justice change over time. And I think uh, getting students to debate what justice means to them in various different contexts is really important. And they're going to have different viewpoints. You know, I think that, um, you know, there is I, I, I'm, I was doing some research you know, before we put this together. And uh, at the time, 70 uh, percent of 12th graders have never written a letter or a message to express an opinion on an important issue. And I think that's a mistake. I mean, I think uh, young people have good opinions and they should be expressing those opinions. So that's part of what we hope to generate here. We don't have a preordained uh, answer, but we'd like to provide, particularly for middle school students, uh, an interactive screen that has a, has a game about the Constitution to help them uh, uh, choose what they think is the best answer to constitutional questions. Uh, they might have a better a better shot at uh, coming up with a final answer on some things that in 250 years our our country has not come to an agreement on. I think what I think that's means. entirely possible. Yeah. Uh, one of the problems that I've seen. I graduated from college uh, 20, 20 years ago, and I've not been back to college in twenty years. So I'm going just off of what the the media and popular culture and social media tells me. And I also have no faith that those institutions are 
100% correct when they tell me things. But what they've told me is that free speech is, is less free on college campuses than it used to be. And I come from the right, and a lot of the things that I, I, I listen to and that I pay attention to or finds me on social media comes from the right, and every, every side has an agenda. And I hope with this, given that there are and will always be questions about what justice means, what democracy should be, and what the Constitution means, that this will encourage free thought and free debate and free speech. Absolutely. That is, in, that, is that is our goal. I mean, we don't have, uh, you know, an ideological bent. You know, people say that about courts, but we have, you know, half of our judges are appointed by Republican presidents, half by Democratic presidents. We all generally see most issues the same, uh, which I think is appropriate at our level. So we're not interested in any kind of uh, indoctrination of, of young people. We want them to have a good experience to help them understand more about you know, in the legal system as well, what the legal system can and cannot do. Uh, I think that's an important point to, to make, uh, but, but mainly to be able to debate justice in an orderly fashion. You know, I worked many, many years ago in the U.S. Senate uh, for uh, Hubert Humphrey. Now, he was uh, you know, famous for sending barbs the other way during the day, uh, even on the Senate floor. I mean, he was, uh, he, was a, he was a good debater. But, you know, I remember at nights he would get together with the other side and they would work out compromises. You know, they, it was important for him that everyone's point of view came into uh, a bill and he would get something done. And I don't know that that's done as much today. I think it's a good example for young people to work together on issues that are important to them in their schools and to work together on, you know, uh, freedom of speech issues on uh, and whether it's a junior high or a high school or when they go on to college. It's important for them to understand the constitutional basis of this right and why it is important to hear all viewpoints. You might get some angry letters from teachers and administrators in, in high schools when the, the kids start exercising their, their freedoms of expression uh, too often. <laughs> but I want to wear a hat in class. It's my right. That'd be just fine. <laughs> so how does this, uh, when, you, when you become a judge, I, I, I'm assuming that setting up justice and democracy centers is not part of the job description in, in judging. How does... How does one pull this off? Um, it's going to take money. How do you raise money? You're a judge. How does a judge raise money? Does that create ethical problems? How, how, what's the, the nuts and bolts of how this is going to be made? How's it done? Well, the, uh, the, the actual build-outs of the space uh, is being uh, handled by appropriated funds. And we, we, uh, we asked for additional money to have that done, and we got that from the Judicial Conference. Uh, so that part is being paid for, but with judiciary funds. Uh, the, the exhibits, the programming, we don't have appropriated funds for. We've used some funds that really come out of lawyer registration fees in our court to pay for the startup to that. But some additional money is necessary. And you're absolutely correct. As judges, we cannot raise money. Uh, we cannot even raise the, the topic uh, with anyone. But we have partners in the Federal Bar Association who are lawyers who practice before us and before the state courts who are committed to the idea as well. We worked with them on outreach for many years, and they're taking the laboring or in encouraging um, people who are interested in this topic to make contributions to help make sure that we can fully fund it and also help with busing grants to make sure that kids can actually take field trips in this day and age. I think this is going to be a smashing success. At least I, I, I hope it is. I hope so, too. I, I hope that we can say when we have both uh, centers operating that we attracted 10,000 kids a year. That's my goal. Uh, I don't know that we'll get that right away. We're opening St. Paul first, uh, hopefully by next June. Minneapolis is about a year behind it because we it took us longer to get the federal funding for the build out in Minneapolis. 
but by the time we have both operational and uh, and really have social studies teachers on board with this field trip circuit, I hope that we can get 10,000 kids a year into one of our two courthouses. And by coming in to spend time in the center, perhaps view a film about you know, how a lawsuit is started and how it is run, how it happens. Um, maybe watching a hearing that's going on. Maybe, maybe it's a sentencing hearing. Uh, maybe it's a hearing on a civil case of some kind. Watching that for a little bit and then having a chance to meet a judge and talk to a judge for a little while. I think that's part of the whole experience that we are hoping to accomplish when kids come in. But we want these centers to be open to anyone who's a visitor in the courthouse. And I think we'll attract, you know, adults who are coming to the courthouse to learn also. Mm -hmm. And finally, I also hope that we can have some small uh, naturalization ceremonies in the centers too. That's a great idea. The the process of immigration, which has been so important to our country's history, uh, is something that can be taught in the centers as well. And we're the ones who administer the oath of citizenship to new citizens. And I think uh, uh, talking about citizenship, I, I think if you if you put a class of new naturalized citizens against uh, any other just group of of um, American citizens and had it had a, a social studies or, or civics or American history test, I think the naturalized citizen group would would beat the other group of citizens hands down. Well, you know, new citizens have to pass a written test and an oral test. They have to be evaluated for good moral character. It's a fairly uh, in-depth process that they have to go through. And the test, the written test, was given to a random group of Americans, a large group, and about 40% failed the test. Yep. So you're absolutely right, your instinct about that. So even though the, I think this is going to be popular for for field trips, I, I, uh, I'm excited to see what what it looks like when it's done, because I think it'll be a good resource for adults as well, because as the ones who do the voting and the tax paying in this country, we are the ones who are currently um, way too ignorant on on civics in this country. So I hope adults take advantage of that as well. Well, thank you, Judge. I, this was, I can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity, and I'm glad to be in front of a judge and not in a courtroom. <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed the time with you, uh, Jack. It was very interesting. Thank you. All right, I'll pay attention, and uh, when it gets up and running, we'll circle back around and do this again. Great. We'd love to have you come and see them. All right. Thank you very much. U.S. District Court Judge John Thunheim.